Good morning, everybody. My name is Anna Brach and I'm head of human security here at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. I wanted to welcome you wholeheartedly to this uh, event on environment of peace security in the new era of risk. You will hear from me at the end of the event, but for now I wanted to give the floor to Ambassador Jörg Glauber, who is going to uh, give welcoming remarks on behalf of the Swiss mission here in Geneva. Please. Thank you much and uh, good morning everybody. It's a little lonely here in case uh, you feel motivated to get closer. No heads will be bitten off, at least not, uh, not by me. Uh, Excellencies, uh, dear uh, friends, colleagues, CIPRI team, it is really a, a pleasure and an honor for me to welcome you today at uh, Maison de la Paix here in Geneva. And of course, uh, also those of you who are online. And I also want to thank the uh, Geneva Center for Security Policy for hosting us in their premises. We are here today, uh, as you well know, for the Geneva launch of the report Environment of Peace towards a new era of risk. We're very happy. Uh, we're not the first ones. It has been launched before, but uh, we're very happy that it's now being launched in Geneva. I hear it's uh, a lot of uh, buzz around it already, a lot of interest uh, in different places of the world. This is a flagship report of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. We all know it by its acronym, the CIPRI. And I really want to commend its authors for their outstanding work. Switzerland is very proud to support this initiative together with Norway and uh, Sweden, Sweden, which is also a co-organizer of today's event. In addition to providing funding to the report, Switzerland has seconded an expert uh, to the core research team in Stockholm since 2021. Jörg Staudenmann is uh, over there. We're very happy to have you here, Jörg, and thanks uh, for, your, for your work at CIPRI. Colleagues, the report investigates how climate change and environmental crisis are affecting security. It explores how to build and maintain peace in a rapidly changing world. Um, we are all aware this year has seen dramatic climate-related events. Think about the deadly floods in Pakistan, a historic drought in the Horn of Africa, record heat waves in various parts of the world. Even here in Switzerland, uh, we are probably not that well known for environmental disasters, but even in Switzerland, the melting of glaciers, droughts, and water scarcity made at least the national headlines. The effects of climate change are a major concern for many citizens, especially the younger generation, which for once is very well represented at the event today. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for being here. And all over the world, people have taken to the streets demanding their governments to take action. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, is located just a couple of hundred meters from here. Through their work, we know, in fact, we have known for some time that climate change will lead to more frequent and more intense weather events across the world. Our planet is on fire. This is a quote from the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. At the opening of the UN General Assembly in September this year in New York, he used these words to describe a double peril intensifying international crisis and environmental degradation against the backdrop of the energy crisis. Climate change, loss of biodiversity and environmental pollution are likely to increase the risk of conflict. Their impact combined with social, political and economic tensions and pre-existing vulnerabilities of systems around scarce resources and their governance. It is human security in the broad sense that is affected. Examples include food insecurity and forced displacement. Oftentimes, the marginalized population groups in climate vulnerable areas are disproportionately put at risk. The Environment of Peace report clearly shows that climate and environmental policies need to become more sensitive to conflict. Similarly, Commitments to peace and security can only succeed 
if their interactions with environmental and climate factors are taken into account. Switzerland recognizes the importance of the relationship between climate change, environmental crisis, peace and security. We are fully committed to advancing this agenda, that is to address the implications of climate change and environmental degradation for human security, as well as to understand and seize the opportunities of environmental cooperation for peace. One compelling point of the report is that the threat of climate change is greater where governance and institutions are weak. And the report makes a strong case to promote well-functioning democratic institutions and strong governance. It shows that conflict is far from inevitable as severe as climate change events may be. This finding speaks to some of our Switzerland's work on, on the prevention of violent extremism. In many parts of the world, for instance, in the Sahel or coastal West Africa, it has become very clear that the emergence of violent extremism and its propagation are often directly linked to grievances relating to the governance of land and natural resources. Considering climate change alone is therefore not sufficient. Water is one of the important issues discussed throughout the report. It is also one key area of Switzerland's peace and development work, improving access and management of water through dialogue and shared expertise is at the core of the Swiss funded Blue Peace Program. As you may have heard, Switzerland is an elected member of the UN Security Council for the first time in the years 23 and 24. Recognizing the growing importance of the relation between climate change, the environmental crisis and peace and security, Switzerland has defined climate and security as one of its four key priorities during this membership in the Council. We will strive to examine the implications of climate change and environmental degradation on human security with a clear focus on questions linked to food security, forced displacement and sustaining peace. Beyond the Council, Switzerland is fully committed to advance this agenda through our multiple engagements in different UN bodies, programs and mechanisms. To that effect, and together with Costa Rica, the Maldives, Morocco and Slovenia, we presented two resolutions, one at the UN Human Rights Council here in Geneva and one at the General Assembly in New York, which recognize the human right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. We are convinced that universal recognition of this right will be a catalyst for more climate and environmental action, and it will place human well-being and the enjoyment of human rights at the center of a healthy planet and prosperity for all. Finally, for Switzerland, mitigation of and ad adaptation to climate change is a priority both domestically and in its foreign policy. We will work hard at the upcoming COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh to maintain the possibility to achieve the 1.5 degree objective. An objective which, according to the newest findings of the IPCC, would allow to limit the disastrous effects of climate change. Dear colleagues, there is no simple causal relationship between environmental degradation, climate change and conflict. The report that we are launching today shows instead the complexity of potential pathways from which environmental degradation could exacerbate conflict risks. Either way, we cannot afford to sidestep this complexity, but we will need to address it. This will be a long and a hard road. But the report provides an important first step to improve our understanding. And this is why Switzerland, why I am particularly thankful for the brilliant work of CIPRI on this report and for your presence today at this launch here in the room and through the web. So I thank you for your attention and I'm very much looking forward to the contribution of our panelists and the following discussions today. Welcome again and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
Good morning, all. Um, my name is Claire McAllister, and I've been leading the Environment of Peace project at CIPRI. Um, I'd just like to also say thanks to GCSP for hosting us here today, and also to the Swiss government and the Swiss mission for all your support for the project, and also for hosting us um, and to organizing this event. Um, the Environment of Peace team has been incredibly lucky to have been guided not by one, but two panels, a high level panel of which we've got two members here today, and also a fantastic panel of youth experts um, who've really been pushing us, challenging us, questioning us along the way to make for a much better research and, and, and report. And I'm really delighted that we're going to hear from two of our panelists here today. Our chair, Margaret Wallström, the former foreign minister of Sweden, um, former EU Environment Commissioner and Secretary General Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict. Um, and also Jörg, Jörg Balsinger, who has been our sort of Swiss and Geneva representative on the panel, um, who's the Associate Professor of the Department of Geography and Environment and the Director of the Hub for Environmental Governance and Territorial Development. So looking forward to hearing from those. But first, we're going to show a short film about the project and about the report, just to give you a taste of, of what it says in case you haven't managed to read it so far. Insecurity and conflict are on the rise. Human activity is putting the natural environment under more stress than ever before. It is an increasingly toxic mix. The number of armed conflicts around the world has doubled in just 10 years. So has the number of people displaced from their homes. Spending on arms is increasing, global hunger is growing. At the same time, environmental crises are adding new risks to security. Drought leads to failed crops, floods force people from their homes, ocean ecosystems die. The twin security and environmental crises are creating new, complex risks and compromising our prospects of achieving and maintaining peace. The result? A new era of risk. Unless we take action, the situation will only get worse. There is a way forward. It is possible to build the foundations of a new security, and it begins by acknowledging that we need to tackle the twin crises together. We must address the root causes of the environmental crisis, cutting carbon emissions quickly, reducing pollution, restoring forests, protecting nature. However, solutions meant to address environmental issues can have unintended negative impacts on peace and security. We must enable a green transition that is both just and peaceful, with policies that avoid sparking new opposition or conflicts. Governments need to switch spending from things that fuel the twin crises, such as building their armed forces and fossil fuel subsidies, to activities that restore the environment and build peace. Environmental integrity and peace are inextricably linked. By addressing them together, we ensure that measures aimed at solving one problem don't make the other worse. Ideally, they would create positive synergies. The Environment of Peace Report explores options for building peace in this new era of risk based on principles of urgency, fairness and far-sightedness. It makes recommendations that everyone can use, from the United Nations to governments, from financial institutions to civil society. The need is urgent and time is running out. Find out how we can build an environment of peace. So, Excellencies, uh, dear friends, thank you very much for having us here and thank you, uh, Ambassador Lauber, also, and for your support, um, which has been absolutely crucial for the project. And um, I am so proud and happy for having had the, the privilege and the pleasure of leading the International Advisory Panel. Uh, and also with the able uh, lead of uh, Claire and the others uh, for this, this project. It has been very exciting and challenging because actually the panel has never met in person. Because when we started our work, the pandemic broke out. So we have met uh, via in Zoom land. Uh, 
uh, and uh, that has uh, actually still worked really well. And we've been able at the Stockholm 50 conference in Stockholm to meet at least uh, a few of us. So um, um, I have called it from the very beginning a formidable task that we set ourselves to try to establish the link between um, climate change, the effects on um, and how it exacerbates the environmental problems that otherwise risks ending up a little bit in the shadow of climate change. But we have still have to deal with traditional environmental policies and link that to what goes on uh, when it comes to peace and security around the world. And try to do that with the best of scientific knowledge and case studies and everything that you need to prove both the problems and um, the, exam the good examples and how you can move forward. And I actually want to start in, in another way. I want to thank you, all of you who come here, because I think this is the most important thing we can do right now. We can meet up and we can talk to each other and we can deal with the very the perilous times that we live in and it's a presque banal uh, to to call it that but we do live in perilous times and um and to meet up and to see what can we do together and i want to challenge you as well try within the the nearest future try to invite somebody maybe from here an organization or uh, somebody from another part of of uh, of the, um, the environment that exists in, in Geneva with all of the organizations and the embassies and the all the people that exist here. Try to link up and talk to somebody that you have not uh, been engaged with uh, before, that you have not met before, and where you think there could be maybe a way to, to cooperate and find something in, in common. That's, that's my challenge to you. But thank you for, for your daily struggle, uh, for the important tasks that you carry out, the way you communicate, uh, all the meetings that you have, because uh, it is very important to the world. We have to defend, first and foremost, multilateralism, the idea that your destiny is also uh, my and, and mine and others' uh, destiny. Um, and the fact that democracy is also under threat and more people now living in countries that go backwards uh, when it comes to uh, the democratic foundations and principles than live in countries that, that make progress. Um, and, and that's why we have to be proud of what we are doing, those of us who work for international organizations or uh, uh, multilateral um, uh, multilateral fora. Uh, so I, I think that if I start to list uh, why we live in perilous times, first of all, you would already know it very well, and it will become more of stand-up tragedy than anything else. Uh, so I, I don't have to do it. But of course, we are so affected by the fact that we have a brutal sort of traditional uh, war raging, raging um, very close uh, to us. Uh, and the, what is new is, of course, that we can follow it in real time. And to, to the, many of today's wars and conflicts are also won sort of in, in the media. <laughs> At least, you know, that's where you pronounce if you have uh, achieved a victory or if you, if you lose uh, something. So we can follow it. We can also engage in a way that that was impossible uh, before, um, but also that we are not yet completely out of a pandemic. And I think the pandemic is also an example of how all of these come, the wicked problems, as you describe, and as Dan Smith, our CIPRI director says, calls it the wicked problem of everything coming together, the environmental problems of deforestation and desertification, uh, the loss of biodiversity, which causes those animals to move closer to us. And in the end, we will have these kind of viruses that actually is transferred, the zoonosis that transfer from, from animals to human beings. And this was not the last one. So what happens next time? Uh, are we prepared now? Do we have a better knowledge? Do we, do we have a better preparedness? Um, but also the fact, uh, the scientific uh, evidence of climate change happening 
But not only that, we, we now have it closer to us because in, in developing countries, they have known for a long time the effects of climate change because the rain does not come uh, one year after the other. It never comes and it changes everything and it causes um, famine and, and what have you. Um, but also new threats to security because these days we also have to deal with cyber and hybrid warfare. We have disinformation and hatred uh, really spewing out of, of uh, the social uh, media, disinformation. Uh, and we have these sort of nationalistic, um, militarized, often xenophobic uh, uh, forces also gaining ground. So all that comes together and creates sort of the, the breeding ground for a, a development and forces that, that we uh, are not happy to, to see. So that is why we have a very, very important, um, we have a, a very difficult and, um, and challenging environment um, to, to work in. And that was the, the background to the whole project. And then we have in this, uh, report you will find, we say that we have identified a, a twin crisis and a deficit. And, and maybe there are more crises, but, but we, we say that the two ones that are really kind of existential, of course, have to do with, with, the, with the darkening uh, security horizon. And as you heard already from the short video, the number of armed conflicts has uh, uh, doubled in only 10 years, and so has the number of people killed in those conflicts uh, in, in 10 years. Um, and the majority of all the peacekeeping missions that the UN has is also happening in those countries that have that have the, the, the worst effects of, of climate change. Um, and then we have this multifaceted, acute environmental crisis. And it's it's almost unfathomable that we have had a species extinction um, that is 10 to 100 times faster than in the last uh, 10 million years. And of course, you know, we deal with such high, big numbers that it's, it's difficult to really understand. But I think we, we start to see it. It's more difficult now to have, to have bees. Uh, we lost two of our beehives uh, at home. Um, and um, because, you know, the flowers, everything changes. And uh, we know that the bees are, we are dependent on, on bees. Um, but also the biomass loss that reached um, um, 60 to 75 percent since 1970. Uh, and also a third of soil worldwide is degraded. Um, and and these are sort of the preconditions for for human life, as as you know. And the same goes for water, which you also mentioned rightly. And I think this everybody can understand. Uh, what would happen if the Gerd Dam, if they did not provide enough water in the Blue Nile for the uh, people of uh, Egypt uh, to to exist? You know, of course, uh, you can see root causes of a, of a conflict that could escalate. And, and that is a, in itself a human crisis, that also the number of people, displaced people, those that ha have to become refugees and flee their countries, uh, has also doubled um, to very high numbers, as, as you know. And then we have to do with, uh, with the deficit. And what, does, what is the deficit? Well, it's really about leadership and governance. And I think, uh, myself, that the problem with politics and my experience also, the problem with politics is really that there is a short-sightedness, and we talked about it uh, before the meeting, that everything is so short, short-sighted and the, the time perspective is, is so short that you are not ready to invest in the things that would really change things around. And that's something we have to look out for. And also that we have not, if we ask the psychologists, they say that we, why leaders have not acted on climate change is not because the natural scientists have told us the truth about this, but rather that the, the psychologists or the behavioral scientists have not been involved to help us to understand why we cannot identify this as an enemy. 
And an enemy is only when it takes shape, you get an image of something that you can fight down. But so far and until now, it has happened somewhere else, maybe more in the future and to somebody else. And it's only when it, we are ourselves affected, somebody we love or care for, or that we can imagine as an enemy. And that is part of the, exp I don't know if this is true, but I think it sounds plausible, doesn't it? That that's why we have not been able to act in the in the way we, we should have. And then we are working in those silos. And that is exactly what we ask you to uh, maybe do. Claire, are you worried about my time? <laughs> two, two more minutes. And I think to add to that is also a feeling of hopelessness. What what can we do? It's a, it looks so enormous and almost impossible to to tackle. And that was that is the the and the fact is also that um, countries are not uh, living up to their commitments. As you know, the most fragile states have received only one eightieth of the climate financing per capita that flows to non fragile states. So those uh, <clears throat> promises and commitments to the poorest countries, uh, the rich countries have not lived up to at all. So that, that makes it, of course, very, very uh, difficult. So I, we are, have then come to a number of uh, recommendations, six recommendations for action. Um, address the linked crisis with joint solutions, invest in preparedness and resilience, and I think that the focus on risks is also something important in our time. People know how to calculate risks, and there are risks with what is happening now. Um, but also finance peace, not risk. Um, and um, you know the saying in, in Latin that vinci uh, passem pax bellum, if you want peace, you have to in, invest in war uh, or in, in arms. But I think that if you want peace, you have to invest in peace as well. So you have to find ways to, to do that. And you have to deliver a just and peaceful transition. You cannot do new mining projects without involving the people who live on those lands and grounds. You have to think about that and plan it. And we have established what I find, find is a fantastic um, way to formulate this. We say you have to be deliberately inclusive. And I, I love that uh, expression. I think this is exactly what we, what we have to be. And uh, then research, educate, inform, something that maybe should be a given that we don't even have to say. I translated that to a number of ups, and I will uh, finish with that. I say you have to, and uh, we have to step up. Uh, the environmental crisis and this darkening security horizon demand urgent and committed action. We have to build up. We have to invest in making our society stronger, more prepared, more resilient. We have to link up because shared problems also demand shared solutions. Um, we need to look up because we need a kind of 360 degrees uh, vision, we have to scan the horizon for unexpected challenges and, and prepare for that. We have to pay up. We have to make sure that we also live up to our uh, commitments and invest much more in peace, environment and transition activities. And of course, never give up because uh, this is the most in, important thing. I often these days tell the story about um, uh, the, the two wolves. There is this ancient story about uh, the grandfather who who sits with, uh, let's say, the granddaughter, and uh, he is trying to explain life to this child. And he says that within every person there are two wolves, and they fight for for the room inside a person. And one is the 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 bad wolf, the, the wolf that represents violence and and revenge and hatred and, and all of that. And then the other wolf is the one that stands for love and compassion and uh, and and the good things. And of course the the grandchild asks, but which wolf wins? And the grandfather says, the one you feed. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you also from my side um, to the Swiss and Swedish missions and GSP uh, for hosting us here. Margot for an inspiring uh, leadership of the high level panel. Claire for an equally inspiring and very competent leadership of the project. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, students, early career researchers. Um, it's wonderful to see you here. I have been asked to share a few thoughts about the relevance of the Environment of Peace report to Geneva, the relevance of Geneva to the Environment of Peace report and initiative, uh, and maybe I'll also add some of my reflections uh, on the report. It's been a pleasure of serving on this high-level panel. I've had the occasion of commenting on it. I'm not one of the uh, authors myself, which has perhaps given me the necessary distance to also uh, do what I do as a, as a professor. The Environment of Peace report delivers a powerful message, powerfully delivered by Margot, about the acceleration of dynamics linking the two crises uh, that are too often treated separately. Um, after a visit to New York, where peace concerns are addressed by the Security Council, um, it's only fitting that the report is also launched in Geneva, which is a global hub, perhaps the global hub for environmental governance and human rights. Um, the question to be asked then is what lessons the environment of peace can offer Geneva, but it is also what insights and experience Geneva can offer um, and how its ecosystem of actors and uh, in the linked domains can contribute to implementing the recommendations, the strong recommendations and principles of the report. Now, Geneva has a distinguished history that touches on most of the issues that are raised in the report. Most of you are familiar with that history, so I won't bore you with it, but I think it's important to note a few, example, uh, a few examples of that history, and they go quite a way back. In 1970, the Club of Rome was founded in Geneva. Uh, the Club of Rome would publish the Limits to Growth, a report that modeled the future development uh, of key indicators and anticipated in many ways the, the crisis and the convergence of crisis that is raised in the Environment of Peace report. That convergence is now. Um, one year later, uh, Geneva hosted the establishment of the Secretariat for the 1972 Stockholm Conference, the event that the Environment of Peace Initiative was designed to commemorate, 50th anniversary. Um, and Geneva was also the home of the Secretariat of the World Commission on Environment and Development, the so-called Brundtland Commission, uh, which gave us the, the famous and very influential um, Our Common Future Report in 1987, the, the basis for sustainable development. And I add here as a parenthesis, to me, we need to talk about sustainable development and not just the environment, because it is the broader notion that brings security, peace, and the environment and society together. Only one year later, 1988, we also saw the establishment um, of the uh, Intergovernmental Commission on, uh, on Climate Change, the panel, not the commission. There's a lot of commissions already. Uh, which is still housed here, actually just, uh, just next door at uh, the World Meteorological Organization. And the list of sustainable development and environmental mi milestones could go on and on uh, and can be added in significant ways also by landmark events and developments in the human rights and humanitarian sectors um, was already uh, mentioned uh, before. The, uh, the adoption by the Human Rights Council of a resolution on the right to a, a healthy environment. Today, well over 100 institutions, secretariats and programs working on environmental matters uh, are located in the Geneva region. And many of them deal with the nexus between environment and peace on a daily basis. This includes not just the UN, its programs and specialized agencies, but also very vibrant communities of civil, uh, civil society organizations, academia, business organizations, and researchers. With this rich history and, and broad presence, um, does Geneva have something to offer with respect to the issues raised in the Environment of Peace report? You bet. Um, 
it should not come as a surprise, but I want to give a couple of examples too. We'll hear um, shortly from three colleagues about more examples. Um, the contributions that Geneva can offer, the, the Geneva ecosystem can offer, they're both substantive, but they're also in the area of connecting the dots. Uh, and I think that's a really important message that Margot mentioned, that Jörg also mentioned. It's bringing people together who until now or historically or traditionally work separately uh, on issues that really need to be considered together. So just two examples that build on the recommendations and the principles of the Environment of Peace report. The first is, um, is, is really about the invitation to cooperate, to survive and thrive and, and to address the linked crises uh, with joint solutions. Since the late 1990s, 1999, I believe the Geneva Environment Network, uh, the GEN, uh, coordinated by Diana Rizzolio, uh, has brought key actors together to raise awareness on environmental issues, organize events to foster exchange, and create collective intelligence, really. One of the areas where GEN has been quite active um, is eco-humanitarian issues. So really bringing together environment and security and human rights issues. For example, uh, but not exclusively in the context of the Human Rights Council uh, meetings and in collaboration with the special rapporteurs on human rights and the environment, human rights and climate change, uh, on toxics and human rights, which was established as far back as 1995, but also on water and sanitation. Another area where GEN has been very active relates to the environment of peace's principle of expecting the unexpected uh, and being prepared, and its recommendation uh, to invest in resilience and preparedness, as, as Marco has mentioned. And this involves um, <clears throat> the co-convening of such actors as the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, the United Nations Environment Program, Grid Geneva, the Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction, who regularly meet and, and really has, uh, has been essential in, in, in forming a, a community where people come together and exchange the kind of knowledge that eventually, we hope, of course, also um, leads to action. The second example I want to mention um, refers to the Environment of Peace uh, uh, report's emphasis on decision making that has to be by everyone for everyone. Uh, and the, uh, the importance attached to the fact that transitions have to be just and peaceful, as well as deliberately inclusive. Here, attention could be drawn to an initiative that is, is quite a bit younger than, than the Geneva Environment Network. Um, this is the Geneva Roadmap um, uh, in support of environmental and human rights defenders, established uh, only two years ago during COVID uh, at the initiative of the University of Geneva, but together uh, with academic partners, defenders and defender networks, civil society organizations, local government, um, and special rapporteurs from, uh, from OHCHR. The Geneva Roadmap has identified four lines of collective action, and many of them ring true and align well with the Environment of Peace uh, report. Reverse the tide of marginalization and attacks against environmental actors. Reinforce environmental rights, enabling civic spaces and accountability. Bridge initiatives and enhance cooperation and break isolation. And I think that last one is really one that rings true for what um, Geneva stands for and can offer. The roadmap um, was organized in conjunction with the Human Rights Council meetings and also in preparation of the World Conservation Congress in Marseille uh, of that year, uh, where it led to the adoption of Motion 39 on protecting environmental, human and people's rights defenders and whistleblowers, showing how that link between the humanitarian and the conservation community can be made and, and action can, can follow and be promoted. And the two examples, needless to say, as Margot has underlined, also contribute to the Environment of Peace's recommendation uh, on research, education, and information. 
All this is possible through the connections that are made in Geneva, the synergies that are formed through these connections uh, and the actions that often follow. So it's, it's, it's clear that Geneva has much uh, to offer in line with the environment of peace recommendations. Does that mean all is well? Is it enough? Open question. Um, I would like to conclude with three points in this regard, and I, and I take there some distance also because I'm part of the Geneva environment, but also as a Swiss German, a little bit apart. <laughs> First, um, to the many committed individuals and organizations um, who work on the issues raised in the report, there is perhaps not much that is new. Um, what is new and what is really important is that the report serves as a powerful reminder that such knowledge that is in the report cannot be taken for granted mm -hmm. and never can be. And therefore, there's a great need to continue the effort of educating new generations of policymakers, mm -hmm. activist leaders and students. Second, the new era of risk identified in the, in the report suggests the need for fundamental transformations. Um, of course, institutions, large institutions uh, in Geneva are not immune to inertia uh, in the same way that such institutions are not immune to inertia elsewhere. Um, and if I cited some inspiring examples of how actors can be brought together to, to, to break across these silos, um, there is much that remains to be done. And I think this is really important too, because where change uh, that is required is not just in degree, but in kind, which this new era of risk suggests, the lack of integration is very detrimental and we cannot afford it. Third, um, a, a key uh, a thing that emerges from the report that bears remembering, and I think also in, in, in Geneva, um, is that in placing quite some emphasis on the consequences of the, of the on the unintended consequences of, of good intentions, which are elaborated at length, and if you haven't looked at the report, I really uh, encourage you to do so. The report makes a strong signal to say that thinking hard and fast about received wisdoms, about taken for grantedness is necessary. Uh, these are buzzwords that are around um, also in Geneva. And so I think the, the, the report invites us to, to think about these uh, in, in important ways. So yes, we need adaptability and flexibility, but it should not be an excuse for postponing actions that need to be taken uh, today. Yes, we need cooperation, um, but this should not be as an excuse as an excuse for not doing alone sometimes what we already know to be beneficial. Yes, there is a need to strengthen resilience, um, but it must never be an excuse for reactionary politics um, or for the kind of isolationism that we see sometimes in the name of self-sufficiency. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margot and Jörg, for those remarks. I would now like to invite our three um, invited commentators to come up to the floor. And they're just going to give, I think, a kind of five minutes each from their perspective before we jump into the Q&A. I know we have a lot of people online. So uh, for those people, please get uh, thinking about questions and writing them in the chat because they will flow uh, up to here through the magic of technology. So um, first I'd like to introduce Sonia Mina Morena, who's the Director of International Policy Center at IUCN. I'm really happy that we can hear from IUCN because I really feel that there's a strong emphasis within the report, not just on issues around climate change, but also bio biodiversity. Sonia has been leading on IUCN's biodiversity policy work and has also led the new Nature-Based Recovery Initiative. Then we're gonna hear from 
uh, Christina Hoyas, who's the head of Latin America and Caribbean at D DCAF. And she was just telling me that she's literally just come back from a trip to um, uh, South America, where we've really been putting into place a program on climate and security. And I think seeing very much at first hand some of the challenges of operationalizing some of the recommendations that we make in the reports. So very excited to hear from you. And then last but definitely not least is Natasha Kami, who's the lead water specialist at the Geneva Hub, Geneva Water Hub. And I and I think, you know, really where she, you joined the Geneva Water Hub in 2018 and has been sort of developing a platform on hydro-political facilitation and how sort of water can play a really important role in kind of diplomacy and also sort of addressing some of these kind of conflict and and and, and sort of t tensions across borders. So um, the floor is yours and then we will definitely move to Q&A so please get your questions ready. Thank you very much for inviting IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, to this uh, very uh, relevant and timely discussion on a subject that couldn't be more topical. It is really a pleasure to be here today as a representative of nature and the nature community uh, to share some thoughts about uh, this um, timely publication. Let uh, me just bring, briefly uh, introduce IUCN. Um, we are the first global environmental union created in 1948 and um, bringing together governments, more recently subnational authorities, um, civil society, so NGOs from big uh, to small, and also indigenous peoples organizations as part of our broad membership with a shared goal that is protecting nature. Uh, since uh, its creation, IUCN has been made it, made it its, uh, its goal to encourage precisely international cooperation around this shared goal. And we provide scientific knowledge and tools, let's say, to take the best decisions to um, aim uh, to get that goal. Our vision is a world, a just world uh, that values and conserves nature. You are all welcome to uh, visit IUCN's headquarters. Uh, We're 20 minutes off uh, in Glon from Geneva. <laughs> so now to my comments and observations, and I'll try to stick to the time. <laughs> Let me first commend uh, the authors of the report for managing to put their finger on a very complex set of issues and interlinkages across those issues in a poignant way, in a sharp and very crisp, simple way. Um, the recommendations and the principles uh, that are uh, brought forward at the at the end of the report um, are really spot on. I think I was happy I was happy to find some references in the report to biodiversity. It's not often that we find uh, the, those references. Um, the impacts of its loss and the opportunity presented by the negotiations that are seem uh, are deemed to conclude at the end of um, uh, this year in December in Montreal, uh, under the auspices of the Convention on Biological Diversity, this famous uh, post-2020 global biodiversity framework. I'll span, uh, I'll span on, on that if I have a time in a moment. At IUCN, we observe with concern that despite global commitments to uh, and efforts to conserve and protect uh, nature uh, and environment, and also abate uh, greenhouse uh, gases um, to combat uh, uh, desertification uh, and climate change. We keep on seeing rates unprecedented in human history of the decline of nature. And that's our life support system. We cannot let that uh, happen. We cannot wait until the tipping points are there and then, or the crisis have been you know, exploding to act or react. Um, in addition, and I was very glad to hear Margot mentioning the 1 million species threatened by, for, uh, of extinction and the report of the IBDES that brought that forward. Um, they, we have that, that issue very present. Um, we don't see it perhaps enough and we don't feel it uh, perhaps en enough, but species are disappearing you know, um, uh, at rates unprecedented in human history. And the fact is that we cannot separate ourselves from nature. 
we cannot. What we eat, drink, breathe uh, is nature. And humanity is deeply intertwined with it. Our 50% of the GDP of the world is linked to nature and biodiversity. But the fabric of ecosystems is actually weakening uh, and the services that these ecosystems provide are being threatened. Um, evidence shows we're getting you know, close to uh, losing uh, important ecosystems like uh, the Arctic, Antarctica, uh, high ecosystem, um, uh, mountains ecosystems, coral reefs, wetlands, etc. Um, and this in turn means we're risking that 50% of the GDP on which we depend on. Um, and those risks remain poorly understood. So here we are well aligned, let's say, with the report. The report precisely points out at how reducing insecurity and conflict in this era of risk means changing how we think about peace. I'll add here that it, it also means how we change how we think about our relationship with nature. Um, and this means changing our mindsets, you know, the way that we consume, produce, uh, relate to nature and to ecosystems. So from uh, perceiving nature as separate, some, something that's there, uh, nice to see, nice to have, but not to interact with, to embedded or integrating nature in everything we do. It's, it is our health. If, uh, if something has showed us that is the COVID pandemic. So it's our health. It's our, um, the basis of our human economies and societies and the production and consumption systems that sustain us. So we talk about different crises. I would say that uh, I'll challenge that. I think it is a big one crisis and it brings the climate crisis, the biodiversity and human well-being, the security crisis all together. And we need to really address that uh, in, a, in a coherent and cohesive way. IUCN recognizes that nature is an indispensable ally in uh, the fight against climate change and providing a healthy, precisely environment for people. Uh, last year, uh, IUCN launched its flagship report, one of its flagship reports, and it's entitled Nature in a Globalized World, Conflict and Conservation. And I'd like to mention just a few uh, of its findings here, here because they are aligning very well with environment for peace, of peace. Uh, so first, degradation of nature is strongly, if variably, associated with increasing risk of conflict. So we agree very much uh, in that respect. This is the case across multiple components of living nature, including ecosystem level degradation of land and aquatic ecosystems. And, conf and, and co countries are more conflict prone when less agricultural land is available or is less productive, for instance, when they are more dependent on natural resources or when drought events are frequent. And here we see a good alignment with the report uh, as well. Impacts of armed conflict on nature are overwhelmingly negative. And species, especially threatened species, are more likely than expected to occur in areas where there is conflict. And in terms of high level political recommendations, I think we are also well aligned. Um, we, we need strengthening natural resource governance man management but governance at all levels. So the way we uh, manage uh, and govern, you know, our relationship with uh, nature and uh, the policies that we put in place, improving natural resource management, reinforcing international law and national laws, and unbalancing transboundary management arrangements. So ultimately investing, and I think investing in all senses, in conservation and restoration of nature and natural resources, can help prevent conflict and build peace. Um, the release of this, this report is very, very timely. Uh, not only we, we heard uh, and we experienced the war in Ukraine uh, that continued to unfold day by day after months, having an impact on, uh, of, uh, on people and that na nation, but also impacting worldwide food supplies, uh, putting a question mark on the, on the power of multilateralism. So, but also it is timely because, and I don't know how many of you would know, but we have four conferences of the parties uh, coming up in this last two months of the, of the year. 
So we have the convention on, on uh, climate change that was already mentioned, the COP27 coming up in Sharm el Sheikh, the Ramsar Convention of uh, Wetlands is meeting here in Geneva in November. Um, the Convention on Biological Diversity will meet at the end of the year in uh, in Montreal. And also the CITES, the Convention on International Trade on Endangered Species, will meet in Panama in November as well. So going to the global biodiversity framework uh, that is to be adopted in the framework of the Convention on Biological Diversity, just let me um, say this is at one in a lifetime, I think, opportunity for the environmental community, and let's put it like that, um, beyond your, just the biodiversity community, because uh, we can set the course straight, let's say, make the right decisions when we adopt that new framework with the right level of ambition of those goals and targets that are being negotiated to conserve, manage better uh, nature and how we interact with it. Here, the report, um, this report refers uh, very briefly, I think, to the Global Goal for Nature and this um, initiative that is called the 30 by 30. So protect 30% of the, of the globe um, through protected and conserved areas, other area-based conservation measures by 2030, right? And it raises some of the concerns that have been raised by civil society organizations, by indigenous people, uh, indigenous peoples and, and local communities vis-a-vis -vis their rights, uh, the rights to their lands, and uh, concerns about also food security that is associated to the livelihoods of this, these peoples, um, triggered by setting aside land for conservation. And it, it, it also uses the term fortress conservation uh, and the, the fact that, you know, that, that we put a fence around where we want to conserve and kick everyone out, basically. Um, I would take this with a grain of salt here. That 30 by 30 must be unpacked and well understood. And what is it that is being negotiated? What, you know, what is the, the text and what is the aim of that famous, uh, now famous, target three? IUCN will take to Montreal, to the COP, uh, a proposal of that target, uh, which is clear in what we aim to do, uh, the 30% of each uh, terrestrial inland waters, marine and coastal areas protection, uh, but uh, that puts it uh, clear that we must prevent involuntary resettlement uh, recognize the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities, including to their lands, territories, and resources with their free prior and informed consent. So it's not a given. Uh, and we are working closely with the IAFB, the Indigenous Forum for Biodiversity, to hear how we bring this, you know, uh, must-haves together to Montreal. Let me just finish because I am seeing your face now. <laughs> Let me mention just uh, nature-based solutions, uh, and this is uh, one of the things that IUCN has been most, you know, mostly uh, working on uh, in recent years and for many years now. I just found one reference to nature-based solutions in the in the report, and it's it's. Um, I was glad to actually find it, but um, it is in the context of offsetting emissions. And I think that we have to get beyond, you know, conceiving or understanding nature-based solutions uh, uh, beyond the framework of climate change and, and combating, you know, um, or, or, or in the context of mitigation and adaptation to climate change. So IUCN defined in 2016 in the Congress uh, in Hawaii, uh, nature-based solutions as actions to protect, sustainably manage and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges. And here you have uh, climate change, but food and water security or natural disasters. And this is done effectively, adaptively, and simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So if understood correctly and applied effectively and at scale, nature-based solutions can, can make a critical contribution both to climate, climate change mitigation, adaptation, while also supporting biodiversity conservation, health, poverty eradication, 
and other sustainable development goals. And I would agree that uh, we have to refer to sustainable development uh, more widely when we talk about the interlinkages across uh, environment, uh, security, peace, etc. And so if we do this, we can foster a better you know, uh, environment for peace and security. I'll leave it there and then <laughs> can take more questions. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Do you want to pass over to Christina? No, thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, Madame Margot Wallström, uh, bonjour. Uh, Ambassador Jörg Lauber, uh, thank you very much. And Cipri for this excellent invitation to comment on this report that I think is absolutely key. Uh, and I think it is inviting us as well to think about security and specifically security sector governance. Um, I would like to reflect on my comments very much from that perspective because, um, and I would like to present, uh, first of all, the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, um, which is dedicating uh, to making states and people safer within the framework of uh, democratic governance, rule of law, the respect for human rights in, in more than 70 countries. In the context of making states and people safer, we have been working over the last two years to understand better the role of the security sector, the nexus to climate change and to human security. We think that efforts to prevent and mitigate the pressing effects of climate crisis on communities and states are multi-sectorial and require strengthening both interagency and cross-sector cooperation for addressing the vulnerabilities of local communities. This also means that security and justice institutions, which play a central role uh, in these efforts, will need to adjust uh, their mandates and operations accordingly. If the response is integrated into national security structures and plans, governmental institutions will be better prepared to face the current climate crisis. The full potential of the security sector for responding effectively to environmental crisis, to displacement and migration uh, due to climate change and for supporting the role of local communities can be reinforced um, by creating the right entry points in confidence and peace building measures. In this context, DCAF has conducted two studies to understand, to understand the role of the security sector in Colombia, in the Putumayo, and in Brazil, in Roraima. And this uh, Brazilian uh, report is in frame of um, other three countries that we are analyzing, which is Palestine, um, uh, the Philippines, and Sierra Leone. And this is supported by ISAT. Interestingly, both studies that were conducted in uh, Latin America uh, reflect very similar recommendations that are mentioned in the CIPRI report. And I would like to mention two of them that I think important where we can see much more how we can trickle down and how we can implement this in a very concrete way in these two contexts. The first one is invest in preparedness and resilience. Countries should invest in preparedness, resilience, and adaptive capacity. The security sector can play a key role, increasing the capacity to learn more about the impact of climate change on the different dimensions on human security and understand the environment and reinforce early warning systems together with the civil society, especially with indigenous communities that are more affected by floods, heavy rains, um, droughts, food insecurity, and access to essential services, uh, and to any kind of protection for coping with environmental challenges. The findings from the two studies in the Amazon Basin that uh, show that the main challenge of the security sector um, is facing with indigenous populations is related to confidence on the sector. 
And there is a need to strengthen the trust and confidence in the security sector. This is essential for an effective security provision and for ensuring the proper functioning of early warning systems and that information sharing can really take place. The other recommendation that I thought is very interesting and that Margot Waldstrom mentioned as well, being deliberately inclusive and security provision can be more accountable, transparent and effective when security institutions can be sensitive to the differential needs of all groups of society and the population is engaged in the, secu in the discussion of the security issues, uh, decision-making processes and uh, oversight mechanisms. In addition, when working in fragile states or fragile context, inclusiveness and participation can contribute to social cohesion, peace, by strengthening the recognition of needs of vulnerable and marginalized groups. To address these challenges, national authorities can focus on concrete actions to ensuring the deliver of gender and climate sensitive security and improving women's land ownership. National authorities could create spaces for dialogue with rural and indigenous communities, as well as initial step to learn more about their needs and strengthening confidence, as well as enhance its training uh, on the intersection between environment and gender and jointly design uh, early warning mechanisms to be better prepared to confront natural disasters and other environmental challenges. Regarding the indigenous communities, um, it is recommended to support the efforts to transmit ancestral and environmental knowledge to, to younger generations, which can be inter integrated in early warning systems for a more effective response to uh, environmental emergencies, as well as creating opportunities to share experiences and tools with other grassroots organizations, the police and local authorities. Well, the findings of both studies suggest that there is a need for the security sector to provide a better response to environmental risk on human security and contribute to enhance the preparedness and resilience of local communities to the impact of climate change and work to increase confidence um, to end coordination mechanisms for an effective response uh, to environmental peace. To create a, an environment of peace, it is imperative, and that was mentioned already by several um, uh, uh, comments, it is not only trying to join the dots, but to work more effectively together across different sectors. And I think here it is not only the development sector, it's not only the security, it is not only the peace building community, it is not only the humanitarian community and diplomacy, it's all we have all worked together to confront effectively climate change and security in this new area of risk. Thank you very much. Um, thank you uh, for uh, inviting me to be part of uh, this distinguished uh, panel and the timely launch of the report uh, Environment uh, of Peace uh, in International Geneva. Um, as a water specialist and on behalf of the Geneva Water Hub, um, I will structure my intervention uh, to uh, reflect on the report Environment of Peace, uh, to share our experience in the implementation of the recommendations of the Global High Level Panel on Water and Peace, and how it could actually, you know, uh, share experiences that could be put to use in implementing the Environment uh, of Peace report, and to actually encourage bringing the Environment of Peace report uh, to uh, International Geneva. As mentioned, you know, uh, by uh, my distinguished uh, panelists and uh, your excellencies, uh, the report is definitely a timely one. 
and it builds upon the need to operate outside the silos of sectorial agendas and to shift our mindset towards fundamental issues of dignity and survival. Earlier this week, an important process took place at the UN headquarters in New York in preparation of the UN 2023 Water uh, Conference. The President of the General Assembly had called for uh, two days uh, consultations, stakeholder consultations and a one day preparatory meeting on the 24th and the 25th of October. The objective was basically to have a discussion on the five thematics of the interactive dialogues that are meant to take place in March 2024. While among the themes that were selected, water for climate, resilience and environment, as well as water for cooperation are selected, and these themes are extremely important. However, the interlinkages of the thematics to peace remain still challenging. In your report, you have identified five types of risk. I would also like to share a risk which the chairman of the Global High Level Panel on Water and Peace, Dr. Danilo Turk, highlighted in New York this week. I quote, the risk is that we tackle today's challenges with yesterday's mindset. And several of us today have mentioned the need to actually have a game changing in our mindsets. From the water perspective, the shift is basically to look into sparing water and sharing water for peace. And I think that the report of the Environment of Peace also is calling for that kind of uh, overall mind shifting, linking the environment to peace. Jörg has asked uh, to reflect on the, the report. Foremost, I would like to join you know, my colleagues in actually commending the report uh, and congratulating CIPRI in delivering a clear and much needed evidence for the link between environment and peace. I appreciate the honest analysis and the calls for accountability. In reading the report, I however felt the need to have a definition of peace. Um, let me explain this, what I mean. I mean, for the Geneva Water Hub, we have defined peace, not just as an absence of conflict, but it is having the conditions under which people can thrive, innovate with pride and justice through access to water. The definition and understanding of peace is obviously different for those in the security and in the environment uh, sectors. And hence, when promoting and encouraging an environment of peace, it might be worthy to have a definition that relates to both communities. Also, the report continuously calls for collaboration. And within that context, the existence of legal frameworks that lay those foundations and make it possible are not highlighted enough. The issue of protection during armed conflicts, whether it is for the environment or the related infrastructure, is important, is needed, and is facilitated by many new vehicles, including the Geneva List of Principles on the Protection of Infrastructure, and of course, the recent UN Security Council resolution on the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts. Allow me next to share the Geneva Water Hub's experience in advancing water for peace that could also assist in promoting the environment of peace. On one hand, the need for thematic and regional platforms to advance the reflections on these kinds of nexuses is still lagging. The Global High Level Panel on Water and Peace recognized the weakness of international cooperation in the field of water and the need for more dynamic hydro diplomacy. The situation was actually described as a lack of agency not an institutional sense, but simply a lack of sufficiently dynamic international cooperation. Therefore, the panel called for the creation of a new mechanism, the Global Observatory for Water and Peace, the main focus of which is to facilitate cooperation in situations of potential conflict in order to preempt its escalation through joint vision of development, confidence building that was mentioned by Christina and exploring options for solutions. 
The Global Observatory today includes 10 partners, regional as well as local, and it acts as a platform, as a network, which includes partners that have a long tradition in water cooperation, some that have more political hats, and all of them have an experience and analytical capacity. These kinds of platforms are extremely important because they are open, they provide spaces for a permanent dialogues, which could either be broad-based or they could be more specialized. What is important is that we could create platforms that have a collective voice on issues that are related to peace, whether we approach them through biodiversity, whether we approach them through the environment or through water. Another element that I would like to share is the fact that in your report, you have continuously emphasized the role of engaging indigenous communities. And in the panel has actually called for people's diplomacy. I want to share one positive experience that we have had is that while we were working with indigenous communities on the issue of lithium extraction and contrary to what we had initially expected, the continuous dialogue and the engagement of the indigenous communities, there were some of these communities that were actually for the continuation of the extraction because of the more overall benefit to them. However, what was clearly an issue, and I think this has continuously been highlighted in the report, is the fact that these communities need to be engaged in the planning and the decision-making processes. So having these kinds of dialogues with the indigenous communities can also open opportunities that maybe at the global level or at the regional level, they have been missed. And the last uh, experience that I would like to share, and it has been raised several times, is the issue of governance, because also in the water sector, it is often about poor governance. In our work in the Sahel, the approach that we have developed in order to encourage the use of water for peace building and in order to tackle the poor governance, we have tried to induce and reinforce water cooperation, both at the transboundary level, the regional level, the local level, but also most importantly at the cross-boundary local level. It is very important to be able to develop new forms of concerted management or approaches. In our case, it was on groundwater, and we have had the uh, exercise of actually engaging an expert group on the Senegal Mauritanian Aquifer Basin, an area, a basin that had not previously had that kind of opportunities of engagement. In the Sahel, we have tried to work with local communities to address the local socioeconomic fragilities, which has been managed, mentioned a few times as a key driver of the conflict. The approach was to empower existing transboundary basin organizations and water-related institutions that could technically and financially support the local um, actors. And most importantly, in order to operationalize a humanitarian and development nexus, there is a need to consider new avenues in which we could overcome the issues of sensitive and lasting funding mechanisms. And finally, uh, on the issue of the launch of the report in Geneva International, I agree that Geneva International remains a place for dialogue and for the exploration of ideas and innovative approaches. From our experience, we have a group of friends on water and peace, which includes 43 missions to the UN, which meets regularly and exchanges on the use of water in peace building. A recent proposal has been made about the multilateralism issue that was mentioned by Margot in International Geneva by Dr. Winman, the Director of Strategic Partnerships of the Geneva Graduate Institute, in which she has actually proposed a vision of how International Geneva powered by platforms to shape network multilateralism. I encourage you to read it. In conclusion, I would like to go back to the foreword by Margot on how we are beginning to understand 
the different ways in which the twin uh, se security and environmental crisis are linked and how we are actually still beginning to feel the impact. I think we need to collectively better understand and use science diplomacy. I don't think that we use preventive diplomacy enough. And I think we need to make the invisible impacts more visible, just as we are doing on groundwater. Thank you. Thank you. I understand that I'm the last person between uh, you and your lunch, so I'm going to be quick. Um, I have three points. Uh, first, um, I was asked by Yuri, uh, by, by Yuri when I give my closing remarks to think a little bit about the bottlenecks of how to how to go forward. And as we heard today, some are apparent, like insufficient financing, lack of deep understanding of the links between the environment and security, understanding of what security is or what peace is. Uh, and in our faulty thinking as well uh, as that we still have time to act. Um, and we have other immediate security concerns to deal with, like wars, which are of course important, like pandemics, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the main gaps that I see um, in this um, is bridging the gap between the top-down and bottom-up approaches. Actually, there's 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 some missing link there. And Oli has stolen my point because I wanted to talk to you about what happened at the GCSP yesterday, precisely when we were talking about the uh, farmer-managed natural regeneration method that is um, that is applied in Kenya that has a great success in um, in Niger, with actually. 70% uh, conflict reduction in a given area, thanks to this uh, very, you know, community-based method. It's it's fantastic. So um, it's cheap. It's uh, embarrassingly simple, as the as the creator of this uh, of this or the the promoter of this method says, and community-driven. And it creates uh, virtual circles of uh, sustainability and peace. And I can imagine that many of, uh, of you in the room who did not attend the meeting don't really know what it is, but I really encourage you to check it out. And getting decision makers interested in methods like this and kind of them making the link. And, you know, there is there is this missing link that we have to actually come together and talk about uh, these methods because it's it's a you know double win as Oli said uh, win 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 um it's restoring ecosystems so you know stopping the war on nature but at the same time uh, increasing peace and security so this is really a win 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 second point very quickly um how do we take it to the next level and uh, i love this quote by uh, einstein uh, who said those who have the privilege to know uh, have the responsibility to act. And we are actually, the people in this room are these privileged people who know what to do, who understand these links, who know that, you know, we have the power to, to, to make something about it, whatever we are, you know, on a high level decision making, uh, or, or young people who are just studying, finishing their studies and thinking of, of what they're going to, uh, to do next. Uh, so we need to be creative and find ways to cooperate with, with each other. And uh, even if the security situation is dire, so, you know, in spite of the fact that, you know, we have to deal with the wars, you know, in Ukraine and, you know, Yemen, and, uh, Syria, et cetera, et cetera, we have to act on this because climate change or environmental uh, the gen generation is not going to stop and wait for us to address other issues. And last, uh, this is really to thank you on behalf of the GCSP. Uh, to thank our partners, the Stockholm Institute for Peace Research, uh, the Swiss mission, uh, the Swedish mission, um, and the um, Geneva Peace Building Platform, who was really instrumental as well to putting together this program. And Annika is sitting just, uh, just here. And uh, thank you so much for the panelists and co uh, commentators, because it was really a fascinating discussion. And I think it really uh, gives us a lot of uh, food for thought. Um, and thank you, of course, Claire, for master masterfully uh, guiding us through this discussion. Ambassador um, uh, Thomas Greminger sends his uh, regrets. Uh, he's actually on uh, mission travel right now, but he's also one of the champions of, of this thinking that, that it's important to address both this, uh, the, the security and the, and the environmental uh, challenges. And 
one link to what's happening uh, next week. Uh, although we are concluding this launch uh, right here and now, the Environment of Peace report, as well as the results uh, of our discussion this morning, uh, will feed into the Geneva Peace Week um, 2022, uh, starting on Monday. And uh, Margaret Wallström is going to be one of the speakers uh, there, together with Ambassador Greminger. Uh, we warmly welcome uh, and look forward to continue the conversation with C3 as well. Um, and uh, we, uh, we hope you are, you are going to be able to join us. Uh, the Peace Week is supported by the uh, Swiss Federal Department for Foreign Affairs uh, and the UN Office in uh, Geneva, and are organized by five partner organizations, including the GCSP. And if you need more information, about the, the week. My colleague Anika uh, Hilding Norberg is just the head of peace operations and peace building at the GCSP. You can talk to her as well. So, with this, I will stop and thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, bon appetit and uh, let the continue the conversation. Thank you.